Uh, hello everybody, myself Dr. Neetu Modgil. Welcome to my channel, Dr. Neetu Modgil ENT. Today we would like to talk with the stalwart Dr. Simon Angeli. He is a professor of Neurotology, Neuroautology in University of Miami, Florida, USA. He has done his medical school in Venezuela, residency of otolaryngology in University Law Hospital, and he did his fellowship in Neuroautology in House Ear Institute, University uh, Los Angeles. Uh, I did not miss anything, Simon, I think. Uh, and we would really love to hear from you about you. Uh, please, may I have the player? Well, good morning to those who are in the United States, but those who are in India, good evening. Uh, first of all, I want to extend my most uh, sincere uh, uh, thank you to Dr. Mogil for this invitation and for you to be watching this, uh, this, this video. Uh, I'm a neurotologist, otologist. I do uh, ear surgery as well as skull base surgery at our center at the University of Miami in Miami, Florida, USA. Um, a passion of mine is cochlear implantation. Uh, we, um, I joined uh, the uh, University of Miami Cochlear Implant Center about 22 years ago, and, and it's been a wonderful, wonderful time there. Uh, I share my time with great colleagues from the audiology sciences, from the surgery sciences, as well as my patients. And uh, I practice both in pediatric uh, patients as well as in adults. And I'll be happy to answer any questions on cochlear implantations right. today. Right. Thank you, Simon. So I got a privilege to be with Simon in 2019 for my mini fellowship with Simon. And I was amazed by his neat, clean and fast surgical hand. And I'm still looking forward my hand to be somewhere just near to your hand. Uh, thank you, Simon, for giving me the good opportunity to learn from you. And uh, Simon, uh, we are uh, we uh, there are so many so many people who are doing adult cochlear implants, but then in India or in any developing country, people are not willing to go for the adult cochlear implants. I mean, patients are not willing for it, and they they have many questions in their mind that why not with the hearing aid. So uh, my first question from ad uh, adult cochlear implant is, what are the right candidates for the adult cochlear implant? Well, the, the right candidate, it, it's, um, it's different, you know, depending on the ideology and the duration of deafness, depends also on the, uh, on the experience with hearing aids. The, most of the adult patients I see present with progressive hearing loss bilaterally from multiple ideologies. They have had experience uh, with hearing aids. They um, usually, the typical candidate is a patient who has had um, good experience with hearing aids for a while and gradually as the hearing gets worse, their hearing aids no longer help them as much. So they, they come to us already with the idea that they want something different to their hearing aids. So they're more ready and more willing to try something different because they've already had the, say the, uh, the failure of the hearing aid uh, in their minds. But as I tell my patients, you know, the time for a cochlear implant is when you no longer want your hearing aids. You have tried them, you have used them. Maybe in the past they were very helpful to you, but uh, as your hearing progresses, then the hearing aids obviously are limited to what they can do, especially for speech. Hearing mm -hmm. aids or acoustic uh, signals that we get through hearing aids are very, very good for environmental sound and music appreciation. So um, uh, patients, sometimes they fear that they're going to lose that when they get a cochlear implant. Mm -hmm. And um, our goal is to reassure them that cochlear implants are wonderful devices for hearing, for speech, and, and they're going to make the help them hear much better and understand speech much better than they can with their current hearing aids. But we also make a big effort to save or preserve the existing hearing, especially in the low frequencies, to allow the patients to use that acoustic signal uh, using a, a device called the uh, hybrid or high, uh, electroacoustic stimulation strategy, where they can use both acoustic signals for the um, enjoyment of environmental sound and for the richness of the sound, and then they use the electrical signal for their speech needs. Okay, 
Right. So uh, there is a notion that the patient, if they are living with the hearing loss for a longer time, then after cochlear implant, they take longer time to adjust with hearing from cochlear implant. Is it correct, Simon? In general term is it, but the timing is very different from patient to patient. Patients who have had experience with, even if they have had a long duration of their deafness, but if they have had experience with a hearing aid, that helps them. That maintains the, the uh, circuitry, if you will, in the, the auditory pathways uh, active. So patients can um, eventually be able to use a cochlear implant when they decide to make the, the transition to a cochlear implant. Uh, that's very different to someone who's been deaf, completely deaf for years and years, usually more than 10 years. Um, the, the expectations are not as good. Yet we have seen, we have seen many surprises patients with what we call acoustic deprivation, when they have had a deaf uh, ear for many years and we implant them and they still enjoy it and, and, and get advantage of the hearing aids. Maybe not as, as good a benefit as we could measure on someone who's an excellent candidate, but it's good to them, you know, because they had a deaf ear on one day and the other day they had an ear that can use for um, for, for hearing enjoyment. Right, right. So the expectations that need to be set right, that's the important thing. Um, right, uh, I agree with you. So now, uh, uh, Simon, if we are talking about the pediatric age group, we know that the bilateral hearing loss, congenital hearing loss, it's a semi-emergency. They should get operated within one year, and if it is two years, it is late. But there is another scenario in which patients are having only one unilateral hearing loss, and other ear is working, they can hear. It is about the pediatric age group. So in that case, what is the right time to operate in those pediatric age group? I don't know if I understood the question correctly. Are you talking about unilateral deafness? Unilateral deafness in pediatric age group, like they are born with congenital unilateral deafness. Yes, uh, that's a very interesting que question, Neto, um, because there, there are many um, faces to this question. Uh, first of all, the majority is interesting because the, in the United States, at least, the majority of children born with asymmetric hearing loss or unilateral hearing loss have a condition that eventually affects the hearing in their good hearing ear. Uh, yeah. And this is uh, patients born with congenital cytomegalovirus infection or inner ear malformation or some of the um, uh, some genetic conditions that can cause uh, asymmetric hearing loss. So these patients will may may you may be seeing the patient when they have only hearing loss in one ear, but the other ear may be at risk eventually of losing function. And uh, implanting early on is good because then that prepares the child to when you know when if they lose their hearing in their good hearing ear eventually. So that's why it's so important to make the diagnosis early. Uh, we encourage to do the uh, neonatal screening for cytome congenital cytomegalovirus as well as for the other uh, viral conditions like toxoplasmosis and herpes and congenital uh, syphilis. Also, we, children who fail their neonatal hearing screening, they immediately go into their um, uh, ideology evaluation of their hearing loss from, uh, you know, um, imaging studies as well as genetic studies and we try to establish the etiology of the hearing loss early on and mm -hmm. it, this is a child with uh, one of those etiologies that poses a risk to the hearing in the good hearing ear then we yeah. tend to be very aggressive about implanting then even when they're only unilaterally deaf. Perfect. So uh, if a uh, pediatric age group, there is a bilateral hearing loss, and we know that it's a kind of emergency, we have to do it in one within one year, should do it in first year of first birth. Then do you suggest as a surgeon that many surgeons, they have uh, this kind of, uh, there's, a, there's a kind of debate on that, that should they do both the ears together or there should be a gap between the surgery for one year and then after some time doing the another year? So uh, what is your opinion on that? My personal opinion, and that is based on the studies that we have uh, conducted as well as other published uh, across the country and the world, is that the sooner you implant bilaterally, the better. If you cannot simultaneously implant a child 
uh, mm. bilaterally, then you should uh, strive to implant the second year within a year time from the first year. That is uh, the best way to assure that you, that child, that baby, is going to take advantage of the binaurally of using two implants. Um, right. right. That way too. Well, I mean, uh, the, the, the better the, the anatomy, typically the better the results. I mean, if you have better, um, 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 you know, if you lose your inner ear function, most mm -hmm. of the time is uh, hair cell disease or cochlear disease, and your, your spiral ganglion is semi-intact if the duration of deafness is not uh, uh, very long, and, and if the etiology is for example, the most common one, like autosomal recessive hearing loss in the case of Connexin 26. But there are some cases where, you know, viral meningitis or viral labyrinthitis, where there's significant destruction of not only the hair cells, but also of the uh, spiral ganglion uh, fibers. And, and you know, uh, you, you would expect uh, a limited result in those cases if the, if the, if the damage is extensive, but yet, we, we see patients who do very well, presumably because they have, you know, somewhat preserved uh, fibers. I don't, I don't know of any studies that can tell you how many fibers you need in the spiral ganglion do you need to, to be a mm -hmm. successful hearing aid uh, user, excuse me, a cochlear implant user. Uh, but um, what we see often, especially in, in some specific cases like trauma or the autotoxicity or even noise-induced hearing loss, is that there are some blind areas in the cochlea. We call them blind areas where the hair cells and the fibers, the dendrites are dead uh, in very selective um, areas. And uh, so that takes um, a little bit of training for the audiologists to um, uh, look what they call the pitch location. They have to move the, the, with their mapping they have to try to move around this area of stimulation to areas where patient is more sensitive to the sound. Presumably, if one of those channels, cochlear implant channels, are next to one of those blind areas, then you try to move the stimulation up or down um, for that specific frequency. And uh, that's the art and science of the uh, audiology um, mapping and programming, which um, I'm very fortunate to work with an excellent team of audiologists who, who can get around these blind areas in the cochlea or uh, difficult cases where the uh, destruction is not uh, uniform across the, um, the cochlea, but where we'll find areas that are worse than other areas. So we take advantage of the better areas to, to send the signals up in the pathways. Correct. Uh, thank you, Simon. Simon, there is one technique which I have seen with you that is a perichondrial pocket. So uh, in India, I have seen many of them are still in the stage that we are doing the well formation in the temporal bone. So while doing the cochlear implant, what is your personal opinion and experience about perichondrial pocket? How successful it is or do you want to comment something on that? Oh, that's a great question. Um, the perichondrial pocket is, is a pocket that we create uh, under the perichondrium between the lamboid suture line and the temporoparietal suture line. And those two suture lines secure the perichondrium down to the skull. So the, uh, there's very little motion, if you will, the, or migration of the receiver stimulator of the implant when you put it between those two suture lines. And it's um, the, the, the other important development that allows the creation of a periosteal pocket or, or the, fun the use of a periosteal pocket is that the newer generation of implants have a much less profile than the old implants. The old implants were a lot thicker and they needed a surgical uh, bed or drilled uh, area so to, set, to sit down the implant, because otherwise the profile was very prominent. But with the, with the thinner implants, it's easier and thinner and more flexible implants, it's easier just to locate them or to place them within within these two suture lines. The, the advantage of that, of the pocket are two, um, are many. One is that you avoid that step of drilling on the skull, um, which, you know, is, is not necessarily difficult, but it can have some side effects, apparently, especially on babies. I mean, it's easy to get down to the dura or get into one of the venous sinuses and cause a severe bleeder. I've seen cases where 
there's been some serious intracranial bleeds from creation of the pocket or uh, spinal yeah. leak or infection. So it's, it's one step less in the surgery of the cochlear implant. And um, that, and, uh, and you know, and, and you avoid those, those horrible complications. Now, on the other hand, for the pocket to work, those two suture lines need to be uh, intact. So if you're doing a case of a revision case, for example, uh, where there's a lot of scarring or infection, previous infection, and the suture lines are not securely keeping the implant in position, that, that implant is going to migrate if you don't secure the implant to the bone in, in any way. So uh, in those cases, I tend to create a standard technique of uh, doing a, a, a bony bed drill on the skull with the, with the ties. Uh, using uh, non-absorbable sutures, but most cases, I would say 90% or more cases that we do routinely, primary cases, we use the uh, superiostal pocket. All right. So, yes, I'm a big fan of your perichondral pocket. It's so quick and it saves a lot of time and definitely the complications. So, uh, Simon, in India or in any developing country, the cochlear implant is not yet uh, in uh, insurance as we have in USA. So we are still struggling with getting the patients, convincing them for such a uh, costly surgery. And uh, yes, with time, the things are improving because government is uh, sponsoring few of the cochlear implants. And any message to the people of my country from your side? So we will sign off. <laughs> <laughs> well, cochlear implants are definitely cost effective, especially if you implant babies uh, at, at an age where they can uh, then develop uh, speech. If you have a, a deaf baby and you implant them early, presumably within the year or two years of age, that can uh, allow that baby to develop speech and be mainstream and enter, you know, uh, develop the school like any other normal hearing child. Um, the issue is if, if that baby is not implanted and requires a special services, either a total communication or, or sign language, that it, it becomes more expensive for the government to, right. to put up uh, over time to, um, to take care of this child with this handicap. So the cochlear implant is definitely a cost-effective uh, way to help these children uh, enter mainstream schooling and then become independent uh, members of the society. And remember that the majority of children who present to our clinics with um, hearing loss to the point where they need a cochlear implant, 90% or more of these children come from hearing parents. So uh, these are parents who are normal hearing uh, adults who have a deaf child mm -hmm. and uh, they want to enjoy this child and educate the child and, and participate in the child's education and upbringing. And it's very difficult for a norm for a normal hearing adult to learn mm -hmm. sign language in a way that they can communicate abstractively with mm -hmm. a child that is deaf and learning sign language. So it's there's a there, there are many educational, economic, mm -hmm. social, and familiar benefits of um, bringing this child to the hearing world, uh, and I think that on on the long term is actually a cost effective. <laughs> right, so true you said. So Simon, thank you so much for giving me time from your busy schedule and uh, really adding the value to the cochlear implant and adding the value to the society by decreasing this handicap. And I'm really obliged that you came for the uh, meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation and I look forward to more, more meetings and all the best to you and, and to your patients. Right, thank you Simon, thank you.